Matthew chapter 27. We'll begin reading verse 45. The Bible says, Now from the sixth hour there was darkness over all the land unto the ninth hour. And about the ninth hour Jesus cried with a loud voice, saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, that is to say, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Some of them that stood there when they heard that said, This man calleth for Elias, or Elijah. And straightway one of them ran and took a sponge and filled it with vinegar and put it on a reed and gave him to drink. The rest said, Let be, let us see whether Elias will come to save him. Jesus, when he had cried again with a loud voice, yielded up the ghost. Behold, the veil of the temple was rent in twain from the top to the bottom, and the earth did quake, and the rocks rent. And the graves were open, and many bodies of the saints which slept arose, and came out of the graves after his resurrection, and went into the holy city, and appeared unto many. Now when the centurion and they that were with him watching Jesus saw the earthquake and those things that were done, they feared greatly, saying, Truly, this was the Son of God. Let's pray. Father, we bless you. We thank you, Lord, for the good singing. We thank you, Lord, that we're able to be in the house of God tonight. Lord, we're thankful for those that have been providentially hindered. Or we're able to be back with us tonight. We're thankful, Lord, for being a good God who hears and answers prayer. Now, Lord, I realize many that are here tonight have worked hard today, worked hard this week, and many have faced adversity, and many have faced anxiety and other things, the attacks of the devil. But, Lord, they found themselves in the house of God tonight. I pray that, Lord, you give them victory. You'll give them strength. You'll refresh them. And, Lord, you'll do something special for them tonight. We do pray if there's any amongst us tonight lost without Christ, that tonight would be the night of their salvation. Father, I pray you'd meet with us now, put a hedge about us, bind the powers of hell, use this unworthy vessel, and get glory to your name. We'll thank you for it, for it's in the holy and wonderful name of the Lord Jesus we pray. Amen. And amen. Let me give you a few things as a way of introduction. I want you to notice, first of all, the cry of forsakenness. Look again at verse 46. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice, saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, that is to say, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? The ninth hour is three o'clock. About three o'clock in the afternoon, uh, the Lord Jesus cries with a loud voice, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Uh, the cry of forsakenness... Uh, 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 is very impactful because from the very first time uh, since the Alpha of time, uh, God the Father and God the Son have broken fellowship. Uh, uh, Isaiah tells us uh, in chapter number 53 that the Lord laid on him uh, the iniquity of us all. Uh, uh, Paul wrote to the church at Corinth, uh, He that knew no sin became sin, that you and I might be made the righteousness of God uh, in him. Uh, uh, can I say, uh, in order for Jesus to atone uh, for our sins, he had to become our sin. Uh, and can I say, every filthy, vile thing uh, that man has or will ever do uh, was laid on the Lord that day. Uh, he who knew no sin, he who was perfect, uh, the Holy One of Israel, uh, became the sin of all mankind. Uh, and when he did, uh, uh, God the Father, who is holy... Uh, who does not condone sin, uh, who does not accept sin, uh, had to turn his back on his darling son uh, who became sin, uh, and fellowship was broken. Uh, and the Lord Jesus, uh, in his most vulnerable mo moment, uh, uh, cries from the gable end of his soul, uh, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Uh, we see the cry of forsakenness. Notice the cry of finishing. Look with me, if you will, in verse 50. The Bible says Jesus, when he had cried again with a loud voice, uh, yielded up the ghost. Uh, 
Uh, can I say, uh, 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 the Lord Jesus, uh, after he became sin, uh, uh, he looked around and realized uh, he had fulfilled the plan of God. Uh, he would fulfilled the will of God. Uh, uh, everything was now complete. Uh, and he looked and once again he cries. Uh, and he cried, it is finished. Uh, and he gave up the ghost. Uh, uh, listen, uh, uh, they did not kill Jesus, Brother Tommy. Uh, 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 John MacArthur Jr.'s got a book out, The Murder of Jesus. Uh, they did not murder Jesus. Uh, they inflict uh, harsh punishment on him. Uh, uh, they beat him beyond recognition. Uh, uh, but he's the resurrection and the life, Brother Brian. Uh, you couldn't kill him. Uh, hey, uh, he gave his life for you and I. Uh, he laid it down. Uh, and hallelujah, on resurrection morning, he took her back up. Uh, hey, what a blessing. Uh, but he did give up the ghost. Uh, it was the cry of finishing. He'd finished the work that he came into this world to do. We see the cry of forsakenness. We see the cry of finishing. But I want you to notice the cry of fear. Look in verse 54. Now when the centurion and they that were with him watching Jesus saw the earthquake and those things that were done, they feared greatly, saying, Truly, this was the Son of God. Now listen, you've got to understand again how impactful this is. This is a centurion. Brother Ray, this is a man who has been trained, uh, who has uh, 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 so skilled his training. Uh, this is a man uh, who has been appointed uh, to put people to death. Uh, and Brother uh, 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 Jim, uh, he knew how to do it without flinching. Uh, 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 it did not bother him. Uh, inflicting punishment uh, upon uh, 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 those that would be crucified. Uh, uh, one of the things, Brother Aaron, I always liked about uh, uh, the Creation Museum, when uh, the last Adam movie, uh, when the guy who was portrayed uh, as uh, 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 the centurion, uh, he said, uh, uh, we make a statement when we put people to death. Uh, uh, Rome is to be feared. Uh, he said, but this guy, something different was going on. Uh, Hey, he'd watched uh, the Lord Jesus that day. Uh, you've got to understand, uh, Brother Jack, uh, most men that died on a cross, it would take them three or four days to die. Uh, they'd get to the point uh, where they die by drowning in their own fluids. Uh, 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 and hey, uh, 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 on this particular day, uh, 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 the Passover was coming, uh, and nobody was to be on a cross during the Passover uh, so, Brother Phil, they'd come and break their legs uh, so they couldn't uh, uh, gasp and lean up and gasp for any more uh, air, uh, and they would drown uh, in their own fluids. Uh, but when they came by where Jesus was, uh, hey, he'd already gave up the ghost, uh, and they thrust a spear in his side, uh, make certain he was dead. Uh, uh, listen, uh, hey, this man had seen many of men die. Uh, but he'd never seen anybody die like Jesus. Uh, this man had beaten many a men, uh, but he'd never seen anybody got beat like Jesus. Uh, hey, even when they was beating him, Brother Clint, in the hall of praetorium, uh, they put a blindfold around him, uh, said, prophesy who hit you. Uh, uh, that's not why they blindfolded him. Uh, they blindfolded him, Brother Brian, because every time uh, they smote him, uh, his eyes kept saying, I love you, uh, I love you, uh, I'll forgive you. Uh, and they couldn't stand looking into the eyes of compassion of the Lord. Uh, and they blindfolded him. Uh, and when they uh, 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 had seen all the course of how they beat him, uh, and they seen that he gave up the ghost and willed to die, uh, when they seen all the uh, earthquake and everything that transpired, uh, he said, truly, uh, this was the Son of God. Can you imagine the very one that might have nailed him to the cross is now proclaiming him what he really is, the Son of God. It was a cry of fear, though. It wasn't a cry of acceptance. He realized, as Pilate realized, he just did something against Almighty God. Speaking of Pilate, it's not the message, but let me just throw this out. When Pilate gave Jesus over to the Jews because he feared them. He went and washed his hands. 
as if to say, I'm washing my hands of this man's blood. History tells us, Josephus tells us, that Pilate, for years after that, you'd find him uh, down at uh, 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 the creeks outside of Jerusalem washing his hands. Uh, they said he went mad. Uh, constantly trying to wash himself of the innocency of Christ. Uh, and they said that Pilate finally couldn't take it anymore. Uh, and he threw himself off of a mountainside uh, and committed suicide. And he died and went to hell. We see the cry of fear in this centurion. I want to preach on this thought. We're talking about Calvary in this chapter. I'm going to preach on some things God touched at Calvary. Some things that God touched at Calvary. Can I say, first of all, He touched a sinner at Calvary. Can I say, Jesus uh, was suspended between heaven and earth, uh, and Jesus uh, was there uh, dying for your sin and my sins. Uh, but He was uh, there amongst two thieves, uh, Hey, uh, and when they brought Jesus uh, down the Via Della Rosa, uh, and they nailed him to the cross, and they suspended him uh, uh, there, uh, hey, uh, the crowd mocked him, uh, the crowd spit upon him, uh, the crowd jeered him, uh, the two thieves on the cross got to jeering him too, uh, but one of them got to listening as Jesus began to speak. Uh, uh, Jesus spoke seven times while he was on the cross, uh, and he began to, li began to listen uh, when Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Uh, and he began to listen, uh, and he began to look at Jesus, uh, and he began to see something in Jesus that he'd never seen before. Uh, and in Luke chapter number 23, uh, and in verse 42, uh, that thief said this, uh, and he said unto Jesus, Lord, that's an important thing. Uh, hey, uh, uh, the centurion said, truly this was the Son of God. Uh, but this sinner, uh, this thief, uh, calls him Lord. Uh, hey, uh, you don't call him Lord uh, unless you're willing to trust in him as Lord. Uh, he said, Lord, uh, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. Uh, and in verse 43, the Bible says, uh, and Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto thee, Today thou shalt be with me in paradise. Listen, hey, Jesus touched a sinner while he was hanging on Calvary, and it changed that old boy's life. That sinner was about to die and go to hell. But I got news for you. He didn't go to hell because he met the master, and he died, and he got to go to glory. Hallelujah. Oh, because Jesus touched a sinner at Calvary. Can I say, ever since then, every sinner that's made its way to Calvary and recognized Jesus as Lord, he's touched them too. I'm glad I've been to Calvary. Oh, I've never been there physically, but through the eye of faith, uh, I've been there, uh, and I met the one who bled and died for me. Can I say, Jesus touched a sinner at Calvary. Some things God touched at Calvary. Can I say second of all, he touched the Son at Calvary. Look at verse 45. Verse number 45 says, Now from the sixth hour, or twelve o'clock, there was darkness over all the land unto the ninth hour. For three hours, in the middle of the afternoon, God turned the sun off. There's a lot that you can take away from that. First of all, science, because we've been told a whole lot recently to trust the science. Science will tell you that the sun is a big ball of gas that has all these supernova explosions, and those explosions give off heat and light. And the heat and the light is what uh, uh, lets photosynthesis come into this world uh, and lets good vitamin D come to you when you're out in the sun. Uh, and uh, we, we get all of our warmth and ever all of our light from the sun because of these explosions. Well, better be careful trusting the science. It's based on limited knowledge. If you study the Bible, you'll find that God, listen, God made the light before he made the sun. 
The sun doesn't give off light. Huh? No, light was here before the sun. They say that the moon is just a big reflector of the sun's light. At night you see uh, 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 the moon shining uh, from the sun. Uh, I've got good news for you. The sun's just a bigger reflector. Uh, uh, it just shines what God tells it to shine uh, and God's in control of all. It might just be a little closer to God uh, than the moon, uh, but it's just a reflector as well because God is light. Jesus is light. Uh, and light came from God, my dear friend, not the sun. Uh, and God shut the light out when Jesus was sitting there hanging. And when the Lord laid on him the iniquity of us all, and when Jesus became all of our heinous sin, God said the world don't deserve to get to see that. And the Lord turned the light out. And there was total darkness. Now, I don't know about you, but I've been down there at Mammoth Cave when they turned the light out, and you can't see your hand in front of your face. And God didn't want them scoffing over his son anymore. And he turned the light out. God touched the sun. God touched a sinner. And God touched something else at Calvary. God touched the sanctuary. Look at verse 51. The Bible says, And behold, the veil of the temple was rent in twain from the top to the bottom. Now, if you would have heard Jesus as the veil, or if you would have heard any other messages that I preached on the veil, you find out something about this veil. This veil is not a sheer curtain like you have uh, uh, behind your drapes. The veil was the thickness of a man's hand. It was four to six inches thick. The veil was made of three colors, purple, scarlet, uh, and blue. And it represented the Trinity. And can I say... Uh, the veil was not to allow any light from uh, 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 the Ark of the Covenant when the Shekinah glory of God would fall uh, to permeate into the holy place. Uh, you see, the veil separated the holy place uh, from the most holy place, or what many refer to as the Holy of Holies. Uh, and can I say, only the high priest uh, could go within the veil uh, and see the Ark of the Covenant. Uh, and once a year, uh, he'd offer up a lamb uh, uh, for the sins of the people. Uh, and he'd take the blood of that lamb uh, and he'd put it on the mercy seat uh, uh, over the Ark of the Covenant. Uh, and can I say, uh, listen, if God uh, accepted the sacrifice, uh, if everything was done in order and done right, uh, uh, God would send the Shekinah glory down to accept the blood uh, and he'd push back the sins of the people for a year. But if it wasn't done right, you see, a lot went into that sacrifice. The lamb had to be put up for 14 days, had to be examined by many men of Israel. They could find no spot or no blemish in the lamb. It had to be perfect. Uh, and then uh, uh, the blood had to be, uh, uh, sl his throat was slit and the blood was collected from it. Uh, and then the high priest would have to wash in the laver. Uh, and then he'd have to go and put off uh, his lamb slain garments uh, and put on his royal priest uh, garments. Uh, he had a miter for his head. Uh, he had the breastplate of righteousness. Uh, and he had uh, uh, the scepter and all the things. And he'd take the basin of the blood uh, and he'd go within the veil. Uh, and if everything was wonderful, God accepted it. If it wasn't done right... His life was required of him. He'd go in there with a rope tied around him. He had bells on the bottom of his garment. And if they got to where they didn't hear the bells, they knew. And they pulled him out and they appointed another high priest and started it all over again. The veil was not to allow any of that to be seen. Can I say there are some holy things of God that isn't meant to be mocked or seen? What you do in your prayer closet is between you and God. And God rewards you openly for what's done in secret. But I'm telling you, there are some things that aren't meant to be seen. And by the way, might as well get on this. I'm here. It's hit my brain. The high priest had a specific wardrobe he wore into the sanctuary and the most, then the most holy place. 
Can I say, I've never seen the power of God fall on anybody that wasn't dressed right. You're welcome. That didn't cost you anything. He said, well, I want to go down there to the vineyard where I can come as I am. Go right ahead. You will not see the power of God. God don't accept you on your terms and you coming as you are. God accepts you on His terms. And when we do what is uh, required of God, when we live a life that pleases God, when we pray right, when we uh, seek God right, when we come to the house of God uh, dressed right and ready, uh, then God will meet with us. Otherwise, He won't. You're welcome. didn't cost you anything. Say, preach, I don't like that kind of preaching. Oh, well, I'll, 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 I'll take some, some Pepto-Bismol on my way to Tennessee and just fret over it all night. Huh? The truth of the matter is, this day and age, people don't like to be told anything. But God's told us in His Word, and God has some certain requirements if you're going to have the power of God on your life. That's why you can find a lot of preachers today, but you won't find a lot of men of God. You're welcome. Didn't cost you anything, huh? Not my notes, but hey, I'm not apologizing for it. But can I say that veil meant everything to the, to the Jews? And when Jesus said it is finished and he gave up the ghost, God rent the veil from the top to the bottom. That's how I know that the devil didn't kill him or man didn't kill him. If man would have killed him, it would have rent from the bottom to the top. But it rent from the top to the bottom because God gave his life. And God was sending a message to the Jews that it was no longer a lamb, that that lamb's blood that he required because he gave his lamb who shed his blood. And that's the only means of getting to God. God touched the sanctuary that day. The Jews have been trying to put that veil back together for 2,000 years. i got news for you. Uh-uh, it ain't going to work. The only veil that there is... Today is the veil of faith. And when you by faith believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, His blood's applied to you. Hallelujah. What a blessing. God touched the sanctuary that day. God touched the stones that day. Look again in verse 51. The Bible says, The veil of the temple was rent in twain from the top to the bottom, and the earth did quake and the rocks rent. I kind of remember something about Jesus saying if we didn't praise him, the rocks would cry out. Can I say when Jesus said it was finished, even the earth couldn't stand still that day. And the earthquake and the rocks rent in fear of what just happened to the Creator. Isn't it amazing? Creation knew what happened, but mankind didn't. God touched the earth that day the rocks rent that day now you've got to understand this sent a very clear message to the Jews an earthquake was a very big deal back then they were always a sign that God was upset and can I say what they did to his son he let them know he wasn't happy about it the earth quaked and the rocks rent. God touched the stones that day. He touched the sanctuary that day. He touched the sun that day. He touched the sinner that day. But he also touched the saints that day. Look at verse 52. Now this is an anomaly right here. Verse 52 and verse 53 don't have a whole lot of explanation to it. I'd like to tell you that... Um, I understood everything there is in the scriptures and I could tell you the why. But I don't know the why any more than you because God didn't tell us. But look in verse 52 and verse 53. And the graves were open, and many of the saints which slept arose. These are dead saints. And now they're not dead anymore. Look at verse 53. And came out of the graves after his resurrection and went into the holy city and appeared unto many. Now the Bible says they were asleep or they were dead. And God said it is finished. God sent an earthquake and God touched the bodies of them dead saints and they arose. 
You say, I don't believe that. We don't believe the Bible. I'm reminded one time when Israel was under attack and a fellow had died and some men were carrying him. They didn't have time to bury him and they threw him in a grave. It just happened to be the grave of Elisha. And as soon as that man's body touched the bones of that man of God, that man resurrected. Hmm. Huh? He said, I don't understand that. Well, I don't either, but God's got all power. That's all I know. And God can do whatever he wants to do. But God touched those saints, and they got up. And after Jesus' resurrection, they went into the city, and they told everybody, hey, here I am. Hmm? Now, why? What can I say? The only thing I can surmise... Matthew is the only gospel that records this. Mark, Luke, and John, who record the crucifixion, say nothing about these saints getting up. Only Matthew does. And we find that they didn't come out of the graves till after resurrection. That's very important because Jesus was the first fruit from the dead. Jesus resurrected under his own power. Nobody else resurrected until after he did. After his resurrection, they came out of the graves. Now, can I say something? Matthew's gospel is not written to the church. In each gospel, Jesus is displayed as something different. In Mark, he's a servant. And Luke and John, it shows uh, that he's the Christ and he's the, the, the Lord. Uh, but can I say, in Matthew's account, he's shown as the king the Christ. Matthew is written to the Jews, not the church. That's very important. A lot of people get their doctrine all mixed up when they try to uh, associate the end times for the church with Matthew chapter 24. Matthew 24 is not written to the church. It's written to the Jews. It's written to the Jews during the great tribulation period when the Lord says that they that endure to the end shall be saved. I'm not enduring the trip. I'm enjoying the trip. Are you listening? Uh, and it's not coming down to the end of, well, I find out I'm saved. I got saved 48 years ago, been saved ever since. Uh, 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 Matthew 24 is written to the Jews. Uh, so is this. And can I say, Jesus resurrected those saints and sent them down there to uh, the city after his resurrection as a sign to the Jews that he indeed was Christ. You see, the Greeks required wisdom. The Jews sought a sign. What greater sign than some folks they buried a few years ago come out and say, hey, I once was dead, but now I'm I'm alive Say, what happened, Jesus? He's the Christ. Y'all messed up. You messed up big time. <clears throat> he is the Son of God. So we see he touched the saints. And then let me say this. He touched a soldier. We alluded a lot to him earlier. But this soldier cried truly, this was the Son of God. Can I say the only one who's going to announce who he is is somebody that he's touched their life. Now, we don't know if this centurion ever believed on the Lord. We don't know if this centurion ever got saved. But we do know this centurion was different because truly that was the Son of God right there. He said, nobody's ever died like that man died. And look at all the events that's happened since he died. He said, that was the Son of God. How did he know that? The same way that Peter said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus said, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona. Flesh and blood didn't reveal that unto you. Only God did. And I say, God touched that soldier. And he proclaimed again to any that would listen. That was the Son of God. And I say, in everything that we mentioned that God touched at Calvary. It was all for one purpose, and that was to glorify God. And can I say Jesus died doing the will of the Father, and He died for the glory of the Father. But He died that you and I might be saved. He came seeking to save that which was lost in order to save us. He had to die for us. And can I say, if He's touched your life, 
and he's touched my life. He's done it for one reason and one reason only, so that God would get glory from our lives. If he's touched your life, one of the very front thoughts of your mind ought to be, is my life pleasing the Lord? Because that's why he saved you, friend, to glorify the Lord. I, I feel sorry for folks that think that they got saved in order to go to heaven. No, that's the cherry on top of the whipped cream, on top of the ice cream, on top of the cake. If God only saved you so he could take you to heaven, why didn't you die the second you got saved? Right. Right. Uh, I'll tell you why. Because there had been no second century church because everybody got saved would have died. And nobody would have been around telling them, Hey, Jesus saved me. You see, the reason he touched you is that you could tell others what great things he's done in your life. And you could glorify God. Now, sometimes it's glorifying him one-on-one -on -one witnessing. Sometimes it's glorifying him on corporate wit wit witnessing. What we did Wednesday night, giving out a bunch of tracts. Sometimes it's glorifying him by being in church and giving a testimony. Sometimes it's glorifying him, like the words that song Miss Caitlin sang, when, the, when the, you're under indictment and you still stand true to God. Sometimes it's your stand for him. But can I say, make no mistake, God saved you that he'd get glory from your life. Jesus said in John 15, it was ordained of God that we would bring forth much fruit. He saved you to be fruit bearing. He saved you that others would see Jesus in you and know that you're real. I wonder, is Jesus pleased with the investment he's made in our lives? Or is he disappointed? Boy, it got real quiet right there. Hmm. You remember that fig tree he came to when he was hungry and there wasn't no figs on it and he cursed it? And when they came back through, the thing had done withered up and was dead. And the disciples' remarks said, that's the one he said, and, you know, he cursed it and look at it. I wonder when he comes looking for fruit in our life, is he pleased? Or is he disappointed? Huh? Listen. The most wonderful thing that ever happened to you, you got saved. Amen. And the most wonderful privilege since you got saved is that you can do anything for Jesus. You don't have to be a preacher. You don't have to get on stage and sing. You don't have to have anybody know your name at all. But if you can point folks to Jesus... Let them know of the hope that lieth in you. His name is Jesus. You'll make a difference in somebody's life. Just as he's the light, when you got saved, he moved into you. We're to share the light and shine his lights so others can see the Lord in us and thereby the Lord get glory from our lives. Let me ask you, is he pleased with you? He touched those things at Calvary to let the Jews know he was the Son of God. And he touched your life so that those around you know that he's the Son of God. Do they know? Or do they wonder? Greatest thing can be said of you is folks that don't really know you say, boy, you're a Christian. Or those that really do know you say, you're real. I've seen a lot of fake Christians, you're real. I can tell you really do love Jesus. And that ought to be said of all of us. And I wonder, is the Lord really pleased or displeased with our lives? You know, the best way to know is asking. He said, if you ask, you shall receive. So in a minute, we're going to have an invitation. Why don't you just ask the Lord, Lord, are you pleased with me? He'll let you know. If he says yes, say, well, Lord, it's all because of you. He says, no, well, the all wants you come get something made right with him so you can start pleasing him every day with all the days we have left. Because I'm telling you, he touched your life for one reason, so that God would be glorified. And friend, that ought to be your greatest desire, is to give back to God unreservedly your very best. Because that's how he's glorified. Too many of us give him the leftovers. Too many of us serve him or worship him out of convenience. He's interested when it's not convenient if you're going to make a stand and worship him. 
all the great stories of the Bible, it was an inconvenient time, but they still stood and glorified God. Are you glorifying him? Are you pleasing him? Or are you displeasing him? Now would be a good time to ask. Let's all stand. Brother Clint, come get a song of invitation. While they're getting a song, let's have a word of prayer. Father, we love you. Thank you for the scriptures. Lord, thank you for that day you touched my life. Lord, I know there's been many days I didn't please you. And I'm so sorry for that. I want to please you, Lord. I want you to be glorified in my life. I want others to see you in me. So, Father, help me to be all I can for Christ because you gave your all for me. Now, Father, speak to hearts now. Bless this invitation. Help folks that maybe haven't been what they should be to get to where they should be, what they ought to be. And God, just do a work. Speak to hearts now. Get glory to your name. And Father, we'll bless you for it. We love you, Lord Jesus. Thank you for first loving us. Thank you for all you endured on the cross for us. Thank you for your goodness. For it's in Jesus' wonderful name we do pray. Amen. Did you know that you could receive a daily devotion every morning in your inbox? Head on over to ibcflorence.com and click on Daily Devotions to sign up today. And as always, thanks for listening.